Welcome to the Mies Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Sharkey, the founder and CEO of Mies, the culinary operating system for food professionals. On the show, I'll be interviewing world-class entrepreneurs in the food space that are shifting the paradigm of how we innovate and operate in our industry. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoy the show. Mirrors life with every stroke of the pencil. I'm giving you folks a glimpse into my experiences. You could trace like a stencil. So this is part two of my chat with Chef Seamus Mullen. We had a blast and we went way over time. So I ended up splitting it into two episodes. And in this episode, we dig into why Chef Seamus cooks, why he decided to get into this, why he keeps doing it, why we all keep doing it. He talks a lot about outsourcing happiness and why that's not so great and why we need to find intrinsic reasons to do what we do which I love. We both bit vulnerable, but overall, we just have a good time. If you didn't check out part one, I recommend doing that first. But either way, please enjoy. For me, the most important thing for anybody that's trying to think about their health or a diet especially is you need to do what you can do consistently every day. By the way, that's why I love intermittent fasting, even though I've decided to go away from it because I want to gain more weight and it's hard to on it, but it's easy to keep up with every day. And anything that you're going to do, what matters most is that you can actually do it every day. And that's why I did keto for like six, eight months back in the day. And it was, it was really hard. And uh, now I, if I do a five day fast, I'll always just go into a keto diet for five to seven days before the fast to try to spike the ability to get into ketosis quicker, but otherwise it's really hard. I mean, although I will say I saw a recipe that you had for pancakes that was keto, they, they were really, really good. Yeah, what work. How do you feel about keto? I think the ketogenic diet is really, first of all, it's, it's terrible that it, that's what it's called, that it's the ketogenic diet or keto. I think it's our human birthright to have metabolic flexibility. That's interesting. And if you think of it from an evolutionary standpoint, our ancestors, and in the same way, the flip side of that, which I also want to talk about is like, I was just at Michigan University speaking to the medical school on a, a conference on pain management. And so I was a keynote speaker on nutrition as a, the role nutrition plays in pain management. Oh, wow. So I was talking to 400 plus physicians. And one of the first things I asked them, when we had lunch first and I did the lunch. So it was a shameless lunch. It was very different from what they normally have in these sorts of environments. I bet. <laughs> the lunch was delicious. They loved it. But there was no refined carbohydrate. There's no refined sugar in it, et cetera. And I asked, I was like, can I get a show of hands? How many people here would consider themselves, uh, you know, have a sweet tooth or be a sugar addict? I would say half of the group sheepishly said, yeah, yeah. I'm like, you know, they're all drinking their soda or whatever. These are doctors, right? And I was like, okay, you guys keep your hands up. Now, everyone else who didn't raise their hand, put your hand up as well. And so now I had, you know, 450 people with their hand up. And I said, my belief is that we are all sugar addicts. And it's genetically programmed into us to be sugar addicts because our ancestors intuitively understood that when they found a blueberry bush that was ripe with blueberries and had tons of blueberries, and all you have to do is look in nature when you see a bear that finds a blueberry bush, they would consume as much of it as they could. They knew that in spiking their blood sugar, anything that they didn't consume was going to be converted into white fat. It was going to make them fat. Bears know this. Bears do this all the time. And the inverse of that carbohydrate indulgence and the production of fat is being adding metabolic flexibility to be able to later tap into that through ketosis and access that fat and use it as usable calories, usable fuel in the form of ketones synthesized in the liver. So I think that the ketogenic diet, I think it's like our evolutionary birthright. It's how we evolved to endure long periods of time without food. In order to do that, you actually have to have enough body fat to be able to access that body fat and, and synthesize ketones. If, if you're like malnourished and you're 3% body fat and you go into ketosis, you're going to start consuming pretty quickly through gluconeogenesis all of your, your muscle tissue. You just simply don't have fat to access. But it's a really interesting tool that obviously has been studied and used for the past 120 years for treating epilepsy. I think it's an incredible tool for treating cancer that very few people are talking about. We have really ineffective ways of treating cancer. And we look at cancer as these like radical cells that are broken down and they replicate and they and metastasize and create a, an environment of cancer that slowly kills the body. Cancer is, I would argue, is a metabolic disease. 
that we all have cancer cells, we all have broken cells, and the question is to whether or not our body is able to handle that, assimilate those cells, or if those we create an environment in which those cells replicate. And cancer cells require 100,000 times more glucose than healthy cells. So if we're eating a diet that is really high in glucose or refined carbohydrate, we're going to be feeding cancer cells. Now, if you're on a ketogenic diet or you're fasting, you're either getting zero glucose or you're getting really, really low, low levels of glucose, which means that you're starving cancer cells. So I think we'll probably see more and more progressive oncologists using the ketogenic diet as a protocol for, for treating cancer and fasting as well. And fasting and the ketogenic diet are like, so I think you have three things. You have metabolic flexibility, which is the ability to go from being in mild to deep ketosis, and then also swinging back to being a carbohydrate burner. Yeah. Fat burning to sugar burning, basically. Yeah. Fat burning and sugar burning. And then you have fasting in the middle. And those things are, they're all part of like the same thing. One of the problems with keto is that people, again, going to the word that you used earlier, people think of it as a panacea. It's like it's a solution for everything. Yeah. It is a great way of reducing inflammation in the body because most inflammation is being driven. If you're, if you're dealing with chronic inflammations, one of the key inflammatory inputs is going to be refined sugar, hydrate. So when you take out, it has less to do with what the keto diet consists of and more to do with what you take out. That makes a ton of sense. I, you know, I mentioned Walter, Dr. Walter Longo uh, a while ago, and that's a big part of what he does to treat cancer patients is fasting because of the autophagy that occurs once you hit that, that ketogenic state. You have to do a pretty deep ketogenic state. Because essentially your body is just starting to eat itself. And the first thing it goes for is all the bad cells and the mitochondria that are that are the weakest. And that seems to be one of the benefits of ketosis as well, is that your you know, your body is not necessarily going to be in the state of autophagy, but if you're doing that plus fasting, then there's a huge help there. Yeah, there's four key drivers for autophagy. And autophagy is essentially for people that may not be familiar with it, it's the idea that you have broken or weaker mitochondria, essentially the powerhouse within the cell which is natural. It's a natural part of our biology. And through targeted stress, and the four like main drivers of that are fasting. So intermittent fasting or going periods of time without food, very stressful. So you essentially upcycle and reintegrate the broken mitochondria into healthier mitochondria. Moving heavy objects, which is like lifting heavy weights versus doing like long endurance workouts that, that will promote autophagy. Hot and cold exposure, experiencing hot sauna, just getting uncomfortable. I mean, because we, we, going back to the, what I was talking about with comfort, we have engineered a world in which we don't have to ever. I remember Jimmy Carter made the case for, I called it sweater gate. You know, essentially he was like the energy crisis in the 1970s. He suggested that everyone turn the heat down and wear a sweater. It was a terribly ineffective <laughs> uh, campaign. However, he was really on to something because we have got so used to we're too cold, we turn the heat on, we're too hot, we turn the AC on. We can create our environment to make it super, super comfortable at all times to our own detriment. And that doesn't promote healthy and strong cells. Yeah. I was thinking about this a little while ago, because you you mentioned autophagy and something that I'm really interested in. This analogy that I think is helpful. If you think about on the savannah, you have a pride of lion and you have a herd of antelope. And they're not mortal enemies. They live in a symbiotic relationship and in this greater symphony of nature. And then the lions get hungry and they decide, okay, it's time to eat. We're going to eat ourselves an antelope because we have the grocery store right there. And they work together to isolate an antelope in the herd. And usually it's probably a slower one, or maybe it's even a sicker one, or it's an injured one, or it could be an older antelope. And then the lions work together, communicating and corralling and eventually there's chaos and the herd goes all over the place and the antelope's defense mechanism is to try to move in all sorts of different directions so the lion can't isolate one and they get exhausted but they continue to just focus on a single antelope and then eventually they get the antelope and they kill and eat the antelope and then lions and antelopes go back to being totally good neighbors like everything is done and now they're good neighbors again and essentially what they've done it's kind of like a macro version of autophagy what they've done is they found the weakest link within the herd of antelope and they have called the herd, made the herd stronger. They've made the species stronger while making their species stronger as well in a very, very balanced and symbiotic way. It's so interesting. It has a Darwinism f- feel to it. Yeah. As well. 
It, you know, it's, it's totally Darwinism. If you were to reduce Darwinism, this was happening within, at a subcellular level, you know, not only within our species and all living things. I mean, you know that to make good wine, you grow grapes in poor soil under harsh conditions, cold nights, hot days, like things like that. That makes for strong fruit. And it goes back to stress. Like that stress is really, really important. And I, I think it's it's really interesting that we can actually look at that stress as being like a disease model. Because going back to the Walter Longo's point of using fasting or the ketogenic diet to treat cancer, you're creating targeted stress that is going to essentially like wiping out the broken pieces that can't endure the stress. It's going to fortify the strong parts. Yeah, there's like this underlying theme that I feel like comes up a lot. As humans evolve, we try to remove more and more suffering from our existence. One of my favorite books is Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, which is essentially, it's about the Holocaust, but essentially that suffering is what brings us meaning. And it really does sprinkle through everything that we do from not just sort of the way we live our lives, but the way that plants exist and how they thrive and how animals strive and live together. And it's so interesting how that theme you know, just plays into so much of what it means to live you know, a meaningful life. Yeah. And we have to have that. We have to almost like search for, for that suffering, which is silly nowadays because there's this is one of the things that i'm talking about in the in the intro to the book that i'm working on is that our ancestors didn't wake up fifteen thousand years ago and say oh look at that icy glacial river i'm gonna go (laughs) my thyroid while doing nasal breathing and and calm my parasympathetic nervous system and then i'm gonna come out i'm gonna feel like this incredible dopamine rush and i'm gonna be stronger and it's gonna reduce my inflammation now they were like seeing that on the other side of the river there was some dry wood that they could stack and make a fire out of so they had to go through the river to get to the wood to make the fire. And now we, we operate in a world in which we don't even have to look for wood. We just flip a button or even take our phone and turn our nest to the whatever temperature we want. And then we have to then compartmentalize and seek out that suffering. Yeah, We have to go to a gym and codify it. And we lift the hard weights for 45 minutes at this time, or we go to Barry's boot camp and we do it at this time. Or we have to take a cold shower because Andrew Huberman told us we have to or we have to, like, you know, whatever. We have all of these compartmental elements of suffering that we've created within our life. We've taken it so far out of our lives. I'm interested in how that idea of leaning into it is not only about the physical experiences we have, but it's also about the emotional experience. If you're in a hard place, leaning into the feeling, just it's okay. Like you kind of need to feel sadness. You do need to feel sadness to understand joy. You need to experience physical pain to understand pleasure. And Anna Lemke talks about this in Dopamine Nation, that as the the pain-pleasure spectrum, as we insulate ourselves from experiencing pain, it dramatically impacts our ability to experience pleasure. So we have a reduced capacity for natural dopamine production because of our avoidance of pain. And also, our pain receptors become much more sensitive to the point where pain becomes much more painful to us. And I think that that is a metaphor that carries over even into relationship with with other people. Like we think about the world that we operate in now in which everybody is tiptoeing around everyone because we're so worried about saying something that's inappropriate or offending someone. And again, it just, it, it goes back to this isolating ourselves from a world of difficult conversation, of pain. I think there's a long-term deleterious impact and it makes us as a species a lot less resilient and more more susceptible to illness yeah and disease couldn't agree more yeah i know this is sort of such a hot topic now we won't talk about it but we're definitely at an apex right now as it relates to sort of ai being more prevalent because the purpose of it when you hear sam altman or someone talk about it is we want to improve the lives of, of humans in aggregate and we want to remove suffering and increase happiness and you know in essence there's a lot of ways in which that can go really wrong where we can start going this route of removing all quote unquote suffering that we're talking about and pain. And that's what makes us human. And that's actually what brings us joy, whether we realize it or not, and what brings us meaning. And if you remove all of that, again, like you were saying, they, they didn't choose to go through those glaciers and they didn't know that that was going to sort of affect their parents' synthetic. They didn't know that, right? But that was just happening. That's human nature. And now we have to almost recreate that in these behaviors that we have. And we're forcing ourselves to create these sort of synthetic behaviors because the world is becoming easier. So I think it's really important. There's a huge place for AI in a lot of what we do. I mean, we're deploying it into 
a lot of power growing means as a product, but there's also a lot of ways in which, you know, it can be really dangerous. That's all I'll say about that. Cause I don't want to go down a rabbit hole. Yeah. I will go down that rabbit hole either. I mean, I've played around with chat GPT a little bit and I'm impressed. I mean, it's really impressive, but it's also really scary. There are people that are much smarter than I am that are thinking about this from a philosophical and ethical perspective, which I'm very interested in now. But the part that really, that you said that I, I love is this idea of like creating a world and in, in reduction of suffering for greater happiness. And I mean, it's all of the world's great philosophical traditions have understood that no mud, no lotus. You need the suffering to experience the joy. Without suffering, there is no joy. And Buddhism does an incredible job of reframing suffering as understanding it as a, an integral part of the experience of being human. And I think one of the challenges that, that we face now as humans, as a species, is something that I think really started a long time ago. Have you ever read Ishmael? It's a great book. You should read it. It's basically a conversation between a guy and a gorilla, but it's an incredible book. And it's if you enjoyed Sapiens, Ishmael is kind of like the precursor to Sapiens. It's in a fictional environment, but it's like it's one of my favorite books. In it, one of the things that becomes really, really clear is that so we tell stories, there's myths that we tell ourselves. And and in our storytelling and our ability to create narrative, which is what really d- distinguishes us from other species, is our ability to have common belief in fiction. We do something. We separate ourselves from nature. We believe ourselves to be separate and apart from nature. And of course, all of the world's religions, uh, or at least the Judeo-Christian religions, have created a narrative in which nature is something for us to dominate, and nature is something that is ultimately it's sinful. So in domination for, of nature, we are separate and apart from nature rather than understanding we are actually a part of nature. We have a very, very important role in that, just like the lion who's, who's eating the sick antelope, we as humans have a really, really important role. But because we've gotten pretty far off the tracks to a point where we are dominating our environment, you know, we're heading towards, we're on a pretty, I think you could say it's, we're on a crash course, but I think it's also just part of, it's natural. We will probably head towards some pretty rough times in the next couple hundred years, couple thousand years, and then there'll be something else that happens. That's part of what evolution is, is a constant change. So funny, yeah, I never really thought about that, but it is certainly like a cognitive bias that we all must have. But you look at nature as something outside of you that you're seeing or experiencing, but not part of you. It sounds like obvious, but and a little crunchy, but we, we all must be like that. I mean, most of us, the very you all know are Harari as well, and some of that I can't re- wait to read that book. Uh, yeah, and it's really good. It's really good. This podcast is brought to you by Mies, the culinary operating system for food professionals. As a chef and restaurant owner for the past 20 years, I was frustrated that the only technology that we had in the kitchen was financial or inventory software. Those are important, but they don't address the actual process of cooking, training, collaboration, and consistent execution. So I decided if it didn't exist, I'd do my best to get it built. So the current and next generation of culinary pros have a digital tool dedicated to their craft. If you're a chef, mixologist, operator, or generally if you manage recipes intended for professional kitchens, Mies is built just for you. Organize, share, prep, and scale your recipes like never before and get laser-accurate food costs and nutrition analysis faster than you could imagine. Learn more at www.getmes.com. I'm going to tie this back to being a chef, by the way, so, so we can wrap up here. In that same interview, you said something about outsourcing your happiness. It really struck me, probably more than anything, because when we think about like why we cook, right? You know, for me, like, I love cooking more than anything. It brings me so much joy to just like, know there's, I can go to bed and there's something like braising overnight or like when I season a sauce and it's perfect or my, I got my whole prep list done. That feeling is just as a cook, there's nothing better than that. But we, as chefs, there's a part of what we do that is somewhat narcissistic, right? Because we are also like giving people food and getting gratification or reaction back. We're getting ego. Yeah. Our ego is getting sad. Yeah, and I, I'd love to sort of understand this is, this might be, it's a little deep, so take it however you want. But like, I want to know why you cook and what you think now about sort of outsourcing your happiness as it relates to what you're doing as a chef. Okay, I'm going to get vulnerable here with you. Yeah, I'm going to get raw here. So why do I cook? 
I grew up in an environment where I would say pretty socially adjusted, well-adjusted child, but I grew up in an environment where my dad is on the autism spectrum, so he doesn't really connect very well yeah. emotionally or, you know, as a child, I didn't like feel seen by him. And my mom was, was a really kind of like a survivor and a real, not a touchy feely, warm person that gave a lot of compliments. And I didn't feel seen as a child. My grandmother was incredible, but she was like, she was also like really, really tough. She fought in World War II. She shot anti-aircraft guns during the Blitz in, in London. She was like, she was tough. But when I learned how to cook, I got loved the way that I wanted to be loved. Like I got a lot of compliments. Food makes people happy. It's an incredible gift when you give someone food. And in giving a gift, the real gift is for the giver because the giver receives appreciation and love. And I realized that that was a big part of why when I cooked, I would get the love that I felt like I was missing. Yeah. And because I started cooking as a kid, I was really young. And then as I got better and I started to do it professionally, then it became much more about the ego and like, oh, and I'm getting awards and people are recognizing me and people know who I am and like got people coming into the restaurant and telling me that this is the most amazing meal they've ever had and you know, blowing smoke up my ass. And it really starts to feel really, really good. And then at some point I did realize that all of this really means nothing. Cooking is a wonderful thing to do because it, it's expressive. It's a craft. I don't think it's an art. I think it's a craft. It requires so much skill and attention to detail. And like when you're phrasing your phrase overnight, you're thinking about it, you're excited about it. You're thinking about like what is happening chemically? What's the science that's happening in that pan right now? You process so much information when you're cooking, but then there's like this intangible component to cooking, which is love. Ultimately, it's love and passion. And you can tell when you have something that's cooked in a bag and it's technically perfect, but there's no soul and love to it versus when you like have a braise that has been labored over and observed and no recipe. And to really land this plane, I want to bring it back to Mies because Mies has been like one of the most incredible tools to actually to come as close as you can get to capturing the je ne sais pas of what it means to cook. Because you can write the most detailed recipe, but ultimately as a really good cook, you have to be observing. Because one lamb shank is different from another lamb shank. Because, you know, I remember at, at Bocaria, my partner at Bocaria, we had a conversation once where he was like, I don't understand the food costs on the Iberico ham is all over the place. One week it's 32%, the next week it's 38%. It doesn't make sense. What's going on? Is there food waste? And I looked at him and was like, pigs aren't cubes. And that's just sort of the reality when you're, it's hard when you're trying to when you're looking at margins or running a business. But the reality is that cooking requires observation and observation and, and adjustment in the moment and reaction. So sometimes I'll have people say, well, the recipe said it only to add this much vinegar, but it doesn't have an ascending. I'm like, well, what else is going on with that? Maybe this pork belly is fattier than the last one. Everything is different. You have to evolve and, and react. And I think that's part of why I, I became a cook because I love the challenge of improvisation. I love the challenge of reaction in real time. But I think from an emotional standpoint, I derived a lot of, and it goes to that idea of outsourcing my happiness that you mentioned, like in order to feel good about myself, I needed that positive in input externally. And a big shift for me has been like understanding, you know, developing self-compassion and self-forgiveness, understanding that like I am perfectly imperfect and not everyone is going to like me and that's okay. And it's affected the way I cook too, because now I'm there's much less showboating in my cooking. It's much more humble and to me, I think, reverential to the ingredient rather than reverential to the chef. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that, man. I, it means a lot and I can totally relate. I'm curious also how you think about sort of the intrinsic versus extrinsic part of cooking because I have always regretted that I didn't carry on my career in cooking. It sort of stopped after Grey Coons. I know you're one of the most talented chefs I know. You're such an incredibly good cook, it's such a, a thoughtful cook, and such a very, very intelligent. There's not enough cooks like you. Well, I appreciate that, man. There was others. Were there, like, I think Floyd was. So I talked to Bark about this, but you know, I always felt bad because I feel like Floyd was disappointed in me for for leaving, and I, I was disappointed in myself. I think about it so much. It's been so many years now. I still cook all the time, and it still brings me so much joy, and I smile every time I'm in the kitchen. You're doing exactly what you need to be doing because you haven't lost your love for that craft. Yeah, I, I haven't. 
one thing I think about for chefs, as for everyone that has that same joy of when you're in the kitchen and you have your mise en place and you're seasoning something and you have the, just the right temp on that pan that, that's cooking that. And that feeling is so incredible. And I think about when I make something and it's delicious and I know it's delicious. How will I feel if no one ate that? You know what I mean? And it really sticks with me. I'm like, shit, I don't think I would feel nearly as good if I couldn't give that to somebody. And that's part of why, it, maybe I justified it for myself, but it's part of why I sort of was able to say, you know what, you know, maybe it's okay that I moved away from to, to find dining dream I had because that's narcissistic and that's not intrinsically making me happy. But I think about that as a chef, if you did it exactly how you wanted, if you had that joy of cooking and you made this delicious dish and no one ate it, how would you feel? Yes, man, what a great question. It's funny. I've actually thought that before because I've, it's been a while since I've done this, but I used to have like date night for myself where I would go and I'd get, I'd get some beautiful lamb chops and I'd go to the farmer's market and get a bunch of stuff. And I, I use lamb as an example because I, lamb is one of those proteins that I love to cook. And when you cook it well and you see like perfect cuisson and it's like perfectly cooked, perfectly rested, it's not bleeding out when you carve it and it's just, that moment of cooking something, I mean, to me, it ultimately, it's, it's got to be eaten too. And there's the eating it part. Then you turn around and you're like, I got to share this with someone because this is so good. <laughs> yes. Who can I call to come over and eat my leftovers? Because this is like really fucking good. Yeah. And I think I have gotten to a place in my life where I'm okay with not sharing that. Like, honestly, some of the best things I've ever made, no one else has tasted. That's a huge win, I think, you know, for you. And some of the best things I've made that no one else has tasted have been just so ridiculously simple, but they have been just about, you know, whatever. I'm just super present with the food that I'm making. But it's inevitable that we all do look for that external input. It's almost like validation too. This is the other thing that's weird. I don't know if you've ever had this experience of making something that you were just like, I hit it out of the park with this. This is amazing. And then you, you give it to someone else and they're just like, it's not that they're like, oh, it's okay. They just don't, it doesn't have the same effect. They aren't like, they're like, oh, wow. Yeah. And oftentimes, I think as chefs, we historically, and this is a big shift. And I think when I opened Bocaria, there's a big shift in this. We used to cook for other chefs rather than cooking for the joy of cooking and for craft. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's a competitive component of cooking for other chefs. Like, let me show you like what I can do. Yep. My skill set or my creativity. And there's just sort of like, ah. Oh, or poo-pooing other people, for, I don't know, for, the, for whatever their vision of creativity was. And I think that there's a big shift that when you're like cooking for the dish, not for necessarily for anyone else, not for another chef and not for, not for yourself, but you're actually cooking for the dish, like you're cooking for the asparagus. That's a level of mindfulness that brings you to a place of presence with food that then when you do consume it, because if you're cooking for the asparagus and you're like, what is this asparagus telling me it wants? How is this artichoke speaking to me what is the language this artichoke is speaking with and let me communicate with this artichoke and i'm going to communicate through fire and acid and salt and it's going to communicate through nature what am i going to do with this and then there's a presence and a mindfulness that comes with that that if you can carry that into then your experience eating it it will impact how we absorb nutrients and how we relate to our food and then ultimately like that's what it all comes down to. That. It's a little out there, but like to the point we were talking about earlier of if we are a part of nature and not outside of it, then, you know, that's a part of the, the experience is asparagus. We talked about Bocaria and I mean, I assume, although I think I've heard you say it a couple of times that like that wasn't your full vision or at least it didn't become what your full vision was for what you wanted to do. And I think you mentioned once that Jan, who's the, the, the owner, great guy, you know, he mentioned that the food is better than it needs to be. And now it probably is, you know, closer to where it is for a scaled kind of Spanish concept yeah. of its nature. What did you learn about scaling food, scaling a concept like that, that you would change now? Because in the same way you were talking about, you cook for the dish, right? Like, yeah, it's a mushroom croquette, but what is the greatest version of a mushroom croquette that you could do? Even if you just went sort of that route, there is obviously so much more Maybe either what you would do differently, what you learned, 
Is there another version of that that you sort of envision in the future, not necessarily the medium of Spanish food, but just scaling food? Yeah, I think that, what is that great quote? I don't know who that is, but don't let perfection become the enemy of the good. Yeah, I don't know who said that. The, although, Mateo, who I know you know from Jasper Hill, yeah. said something to me that like scared the crap out of me. Okay. He said, standardization is the enemy. Yeah. Just separate from perfection. Yeah. I appreciate that from a cheesemaker because that's, a, <laughs> honestly, what he's tapped into is that's, again, being a part of nature. He's dealing with a live product that changes depending upon the season, just changes depending upon the-, the Every day, the milk changes, yeah. And being like the goat, what the goat ate, all of that. There's like so much variation that there is standardization becomes completely impossible. And that's, again, pigs aren't cubes. Like that's cool. That's us accepting our part of nature, not apart from nature. Standardization is a continuation of our desire to dominate nature. And that said, as a consumer, someone who's coming into a restaurant and they're eating a restaurant concept in New York, and then they would go to the same restaurant concept in Chicago, their expectation, their desire is that it's going to be the same. And I think there's definitely a point at which perfection does become the enemy of the good, where if you become so dependent upon individual skill, and beyond individual skill, it's not just skill, but it's also like passion and mindfulness and plating. Like think about, this is an issue that we have here all the time. I'm actually, I'm at Rosewood in Palo Alto right now. And it's an issue we have all the time here with a crudite dish that it's so incredibly simple. We have, it's, it has a beautiful green tahini dip and seasonal vegetables. And yet it's really difficult to get every person who's cooking it to choose, select, and assemble the vegetables with the same level of care because it's so simple. You have to really, really work to make sure that every radish looks great. Every leaf of lettuce looks great. And the, the way in which it's, it's organized on the plate looks natural. And you can't, it's, so, it's one of those things that's so hard to standardize because it's like painting a picture. And you can't ask, like, every time you have someone new on the station, paint me this, this Rembrandt. Like, everyone's going to do their best, but it becomes difficult to standardize that. So I think that when you reach too far for, for expressiveness in food, it makes it incredibly challenging to create consistency. And, and ultimately, I do think consistency is, is important. I think consistency, there's a difference between standardization and consistency. To me, standardization means that like this is the shape of the bottle and it's always going to be exactly like this because it's made by AI. And consistency means I'm going to give you liquid in a bottle and sometimes it's going to look like this and sometimes it might look more like this. But it's still liquid in the bottle. And there's a certain amount of wiggle room that's acceptable. And I think that part of that is figuring out what is the equation that defines the wiggle room, the, the variance that's acceptable. And then there's also a, a part of, of that that requires entrusting the people who are making it and believing in them and giving them the tools to succeed and allowing them an input into it. Now, you don't want like your AM cook to cook the crudite one way and your PM cook to cook the crudite another way or play the other way, but you want to get, allow them the expressive freedom to be able to put their fingerprint on it. I never thought about it that way. That's so... Scaling good food requires consistency, but not standardization, and they're different. They're different. Yeah, yeah I never really thought about that, but they are because consistency is really consistency delivering X, and X is why you do it. The experience you want to have. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that it's always going to be a four inch piece of endive that's cut X, Y, step. You have, you want to deliver the same exact experience every time. And the reason why that dish is the way that it is. And that is harder than having a exactly four inch diameter McDonald's burger with the exact size bun with X amount of sesame seeds, because you can engineer that and make sure that it's the same every single time. It just costs more money, but it's way harder to scale consistency unless you're really clear on why you're doing it yeah and really clear on what the experience is supposed to be yeah and the end result could be different like you might actually have a better end experience if you can focus on consistency versus standardization because if let's say for instance you're making a recipe that's got olives anchovies and preserved lemons three salted 
items and you follow a standardized recipe that says you four grams of olives, four grams of, of preserved lemon, and four grams of, of, of anchovies. And then it has like one gram of salt that has something else in it too. And then you happen to get a shipment of olives that are over cured. And so they have a higher sodium content than when the recipe is written. And so if you follow the standardization, you're like, well, I do exactly what I'm supposed I'm standardizing. I'm a robot. I do exactly the same thing. You're going to end up with a product that's going to be too salty. But if you are consistent about what the end result is and you understand that and you empower and train the cooks who are making it, develop their palate and understand like what the end result is that you're looking for, then they have the freedom to create adjustment so that they can achieve consistency. Because standardization does not necessarily lead to consistency. The only thing that leads to consistency is consistency. Yeah. I think that's a good place to wrap up here because I, I don't know about you. I've, I've learned. Land the plane on that. I've learned a ton today. Yeah. Fine. Also, just what a great way to catch up because we haven't been able to talk that much in the last couple of years. But congrats, man, on everything. I can't wait to see the new book when it comes out. I did want to ask, by the way, what is that blender that you oh, the beats. that I see all the time? The beats. Yeah. Because our Nutra, whatever, that bullet, whatever the thing we have at Nutra Bullet. Yeah. Nutra bullet. Has broken like four times. So if you have a better version, please oh, tell yeah. me. Oh yeah, the beast. Absolutely, it's my friend Colin who developed it. Was the founder of Nutribullet, so he took all his learnings from Nutribullet and he turned it into a brilliant blender. Yeah, love it. It's so good. The you beast. Love it. Okay. Yeah, it's the beast. All right, I'll check it out. Yeah. Cool, man. Anything else you want to? I appreciate this. We didn't like make this a a Mies advertisement, but I do want to thank you for what you've developed in Mies because it's something that. Is a tool that I've wanted for years because it, nothing like that has existed. And it's become so integrated into my daily life. Like I, I have my phone right here. And I'm literally like, I'm always using knees. It's such a, a great tool. And, and I love the ability to be able to, I could literally write cookbooks now just by going into knees and just, I got a cookbook because I have so many recipes that I built into them and they're, the interface is always improving. It's a really great tool. I know this is an overused term, but it's totally a game changer and it has been. So I just wanted to thank you for that, for what you guys have developed. I think it's it's wonderful. And the more we can empower people to cook real food, the better. And it's a great tool for doing. Thank you, man. That means a lot coming from you. So thank you. We have, we have a lot more work to do to make it what it needs to become. I'm really grateful to hear that you're getting value out of it. So thank you. Awesome, man. All right, man. Well, next time I'm in LA, I will hit you up. You'll let me know. Yeah, we'll, we'll go for a workout. I won't run because my knee is all messed up. I'll bike. You want? Yeah, we'll go for a bike ride <laughs> and do a cold plunge and sauna and we'll make a good meal. All right, brother. Good seeing you, man. All right. Take care. Yep. Bye. Take care. Thanks for tuning into the Mies Podcast. The music from the show is a remix of the song Art Mirror by an old friend, hip-hop artist, Fresh Daily. For show notes and more, visit getmes.com forward slash podcast. That's G-E-T-M-E-Z dot com forward slash podcast. If you enjoyed the show, I'd love it if you can share it with your fellow entrepreneurs and culinary pros and give us a five-star rating wherever you listen to your podcasts. Keep innovating. Don't settle. Make today a little better than yesterday. And remember, it's impossible for us to learn what we think we already know. See you next time.